News of the Times, Whitechapel Wednesdays, Part 6 Welcome to our series of Whitechapel Wednesdays. In this weekly series, we pull together news reports in chronological order leading up to the infamous series of slayings. As Ripper enthusiasts will know, there is considerable discussion as to whether the slayings were confirmed only to the five reported. We have included reports outside of the five to show the build-up of terror in the Whitechapel area. We have also included other, sometimes seemingly minor, news stories during this time to give you a picture of the life and times of Whitechapel of 1888 as events build to the series of slayings. In this series we offer no comment, but adhered strictly to the papers of the time, all in chronological order. We hope you enjoy the show. Recap of last week. In last week's episode of Whitechapel Wednesdays 5, further investigations are ongoing of Mary Ann Polly Nichols. Then a new brutal murder occurs, found only a few hundred yards from where the body of Mary Ann had been found. This new body is stated to be considerably more horribly disfigured than Mary Ann's body. And what of the message? Five, fifteen more, and then I give myself up. In this episode, all the facts are attempted to be pulled together with witness testimony to try to find the murderer. From the Easter Evening News, the 10th of September 1888, the horrible murder in Whitechapel, mutilation of the victim, panic in the East End, an arrest, exciting chase. As we reported in our last issue, the neighbourhood of Whitechapel was horrified on Saturday to a degree bordering on panic by the discovery of another barbarous murder of a woman at 29 Hanbury Street, later called Browns Lane, Spitalfields. Hanbury Street is a thoroughfare running between Commercial Street and Whitechapel Road, the occupants of which are poor and for the most part of Jewish extraction. The circumstances of the murder are of such a revolting character as to point the conclusion that it has been perpetrated by the same hand as committed that in Bucks Row and the other two previous murders, all of which have occurred within a stone's throw of each other. The murdered woman, who appears to have been respectably connected, was known in the neighbourhood by women of the unfortunate class as Annie Siv, but her real name was Annie Chapman. She is described by those who knew her best as a decent, though poor-looking woman, about five foot two or five foot three high, with fair brown wavy hair, blue eyes, large flat nose, and, strange to say, She had two of her front teeth missing, as had Mary Ann Nichols, who was murdered in Bucks Row. When her body was found on Saturday morning, it was respectably clad. She wore no head covering, but simply a skirt and bodice and two light petticoats. A search being made in her pockets, nothing was found but an envelope stamped the Sussex Regiment. The house in Hanbury Street, in the yard of which the crime was committed, is occupied by a woman named Richardson, who employs several men in the rough packing line. There is a small shop in front, at the basement of the house, which is utilised for the purpose of a cat's meat shop. From the upper end of the house there is a passage with the door at either end leading to a small yard, some thirteen or fourteen feet square, separated from the adjoining houses by a slight wooden fence. 
there is no outlet at the back and any person who gains access must of necessity make his exit from the same end as his entry. In the yard there were recently some packing cases which had been sent up from the basement of the dwelling, but just behind the lower door there was a clear space left, wherein the murder was undoubtedly committed. The theory primarily formed was that the unfortunate victim had been first murdered and afterwards dragged through the entry into the backyard, but from an inspection made later in the day, it appears that the murder was actually committed in the corner of the yard, which the back door, when open, places in obscurity. There were on Saturday some marks of blood observable in the passage, but it is now known that these were caused during the work of removal of some packing cases, the edges of which accidentally came into contact with the blood which remained upon the spot from which the unhappy victim was removed. The evidence which has been collected up to the present shows that the murder was committed shortly before half past five o'clock in the morning. Albert Cadsoch, who lodges next door, had the occasion to go into the adjoining yard at the back at 5.25, and states that he heard a conversation on the other side of the palings as if between two people. He caught the word no and fancied he subsequently heard a slight scuffle with the noise of a falling against the palings, but thinking that his neighbours might probably be out in the yard, he took no further notice and went to his work. Nothing further can be traced of the dreadful tragedy until shortly before six o'clock when the man Davis, passing into the yard at the back of 29 Hanbury Street, observed a mutilated mass, which caused him to go shrieking in a fright into the street. In the house, the back premises of which happened to become the scene of this hideous crime, no fewer than six separate families reside. Some people who live on the ground floor and are credited with being light sleepers, stated emphatically that during the night and morning they heard no sound of a suspicious nature, which is likely enough in view of the fact that the passage from the front to the back of the house has been invariably left open for the convenience of dwellers in the building, the traffic being constant. One of the occupants of the house is a man named John Davis, a porter in the Spitalfields Market. When he discovered the body in the yard, he made no attempt to ascertain the condition of the deceased, but immediately alarmed the other inmates of the house and then proceeded to acquaint the police at the commercial street station of what had occurred. In the meantime, Mrs. Richardson, the principal occupier of the premises, together with a young woman, named Eliza Cooksley, sleeping on the second floor, were aroused and, under the notion that the building was on fire, ran to the back bedroom window, whence they were enabled to see the murdered woman lying on the paved yard, her clothes disarranged, and her person horribly mutilated. On the wall of the court in which the body was found were the words written, Five Fifteen more, and then I give myself up. When the police arrived, they found that the woman had been murdered in a terribly brutal fashion. It was obviously both from the marks upon the body and of the splashes of blood upon the palings which separate the dwellings one from the other, that the woman, while lying down, had her throat cut and then was ripped open and disemboweled. The perpetrator of the ghastly deed undoubtedly occupied some considerable time in doing his victim to death, inasmuch as it appeared that he, with fiendish resolve, not only killed the object of his caprice or passion, but afterwards mutilated her body in a terrible manner, leaving the heart and liver lying by the shoulder. 
there is on every hand the one opinion prevailing that the Whitechapel murders had been all enacted by the same person. The mortuary in which the body of the murdered woman lies is situated at the corner of Eagle Street, a cul-de-sac ending in a pair of green doors, within which several officers of the police guard the remains of the dead. The body is already in a shell, and the autopsy having been made by Dr. Phillips and his assistants, the portions of flesh and entrails removed by the fiendish hands of the murderer have been so far as possibly replaced in their natural positions, and there is little else observable beyond the usual post-mortem indications. The body is that of a fairly well-nourished woman, but bears traces of rough usage. The corpse is covered with a wrap, and those in custody of it are charged by the police authorities that it shall neither be shown to any person nor disturbed in any way. The district coroner visited the mortuary on Saturday afternoon and made arrangements for holding an inquest this morning at 10.30 at the Boys' Refuge near Whitechapel Station. The woman's name is Annie Chapman, alias Siv. She comes from Windsor and has friends residing at Vauxhall. Her home was a lodging house at 35 Dorset Street in Whitechapel. Her husband was a pensioner who allowed her ten shillings a week but he died twelve months ago, and the pension ceasing, she has since earned her living in the streets. She lived for a time with a man named Siv. She was identified at the mortuary at half-past seven in the morning by Frederick Simmons, a young man living in the same house with her. Simmons identified her without difficulty, first by her handkerchief and then by her face, and said that she had three rings on when she left the house, one a wedding ring and the other two chaste. These had disappeared, having evidently been mistaken for gold and stolen by the assassin. For the last nine months she had been sleeping at night or early in the morning rather at a common lodging house in 35 Dorset Street, Spitalfields, and she was there as recently as two o'clock on Saturday morning eating some potatoes. She had not, however, the money to pay for the bed, and at two o'clock she left with the remark to the shopkeeper of the place, I'll soon be back again, I'll soon get the money for my dos. The woman's height is exactly five feet. The complexion is fair, with wavy dark brown hair, the eyes are blue, and the two lower teeth have been knocked out. The nose is rather large and prominent, and the third finger on the left hand bears signs of rings having been wrenched off, and the hands and arms are considerably bruised. The deceased had on laced-up boots and striped stockings. She had on two cotton petticoats and was otherwise respectably dressed. Nothing was found in her pockets, but a handkerchief and two small combs. The only clue of any value is furnished by Mrs. Fiddlemont, wife of the proprietor of the Prince Albert public house, half a mile from the scene of the murder. Mrs. Fiddlemont states that at seven o'clock in the morning she was standing in the bar talking with another woman, a friend in the first compartment. Suddenly there came into the middle compartment a man whose rough appearance frightened her. He had on a brown stiff hat, a dark coat, and no waistcoat. He came in with his hat down over his eyes, with his face partly concealed, and asked for half a pint of four ale. She drew the ale, and meanwhile looked at him through the mirror at the back of the bar. As soon as he saw the woman in the other compartment watching him, he turned his back and got the partition between himself and her. The thing that struck Mrs. Philmont particularly was the fact 
that there was blood spots on the back of his right hand. This, taken in connection with his appearance, caused her some uneasiness. She also noticed that his shirt was torn. As soon as he had drunk the ale, which he swallowed at a gulp, he went out. Her friend went out also to watch him. Her friend is Mrs. Mary Chapel, who lives at 28 Stewart Street, nearby. Her story corroborates Mrs. Fiddlemont and is more particular. When the man came in, the expression in his eyes caught her attention. His look was so startling and terrifying, it frightened Mrs. Fiddlemont so that she requested her to stay. He wore a light blue check shirt, which was torn badly into rags, in fact, on the right shoulder. There was a narrow streak of blood under his right ear, parallel with the edge of his shirt. There was also dried blood between the fingers of his hands. When he went out, she slipped out through the other door and watched him as he went towards Bishopsgate Street. She called Joseph Taylor's attention to him, and Joseph Taylor followed him. Joseph Taylor, a builder at 22 Stewart Street, states that as soon as his attention was attracted to the man, he followed him. He walked rapidly and came out alongside him, but did not speak to him. The man was rather thin, about five foot eight in height, and apparently between about forty and fifty years of age. He had a shabby, genteel look, pepper and salt trousers, which fitted badly, and a dark coat. When Taylor came alongside him, the man glanced at him, and Taylor's description of the look was, his eyes were wild as a hawk. Taylor is a perfectly reliable man, well known through the neighbourhood. The man walked, he says, holding his coat together at the top. He had a nervous and frightened way about him. He wore a ginger-coloured moustache and had short, sandy hair. Taylor ceased to follow him, but watched him as far as Half Moon Street, where he became lost to view. It is said that Dark Annie, as the woman was called by her companions, was seen drinking at a tavern in Brick Lane, with the man supposed to be her murderer. The barmaid says she opened the place at five o'clock, as is customary on a Saturday morning, as Spittlefields Market is in the near vicinity. She was too busy to notice whom she served. She might have served the woman indeed. She had been told by those who knew her that she had, but she had no recollection of it, and certainly could not say whether the unfortunate creature was accompanied by a man. The terror and excitement were somewhat abating when, at about eleven o'clock, the people who had congregated in Commercial Street were thrown into a fresh state of alarm. It was rumoured that about a quarter of an hour previously the man who was supposed to be the murderer or connected with the murder had been seen in the locality. But this statement, owing to the want of previous success detecting the perpetrators of the other murders, was received with incredulity. A short time afterwards, however, a young man apparently about 25 years of age was seen running down Commercial Street at full speed, followed by a large body of policemen with drawn battens and a large crowd of persons. The man was gradually gaining on his pursuers, but owing to the cries of the policemen, a large body of men and women blocked the street. The man at once grasped the situation and rushed down a side street. The excitement at this time became intense, as it was thought that the man who was supposed to be the murderer would escape. After an interval of about two minutes, however, a cheer was raised, and shortly afterwards the man was seen between five or six policemen. It would be almost impossible to describe his appearance. He was a picture of terror the colour of his face being between a ghastly white and yellow. He is about the medium height and was fairly dressed. 
When the police arrived in Commercial Street, the people crowded around in order to look at the captured man, but they were kept at a distance by a body of policemen. The man was taken to Commercial Street Police Station, and it is thought that in consequence of this arrest, a clue will be obtained as to the perpetrators of the dastardly crimes which have thrown the inhabitants of the district into the greatest state of alarm during the last few weeks. The Press Association says, Up to midnight on Saturday, no arrest had been made. The police confess they have no clue, but they are making efforts to put an end to the mystery and to bring the criminal to justice. A large number of detectives and police are scouring the neighbourhood. Shortly before midnight, the police received information, the three rings answering the description of those taken from the murdered woman had been taken in pledge by a pawnbroker in Mile End Road. A woman who knew the deceased well was at once sent to see if she could identify the rings, but she failed to do so. In the meantime, the police had ascertained that the person who pledged them had a right to do so. So, Mrs. Fiddlemont, the wife of the proprietor of the Prince Albert pub, half a mile from the scene of the murder, states that she will be able to identify the man who entered her house early on Saturday morning with stains of blood on him. The Press Association telegraphed at midnight last night. Hanbury Street Whitechapel was this morning in an all but impassable state, owing to the crowds which had assembled in the neighbourhood of the scene of the latest East End tragedy. Some thousands of people passed through the locality during the early part of the day, and the police authorities at Commercial Street Police Station had a number of constables drafted from other parts of the metropolis, and these as evening advanced, were busily occupied in keeping people moving. The public excitement as the day advanced appeared rather to grow than to diminish, and strong evidence of the fact was apparent in the evening. Not only did large crowds of the poorer classes loiter in the vicinity of the spot where the murder was committed, but a number of the more well-to-do was to be seen either gazing with awe-stricken faces at Mrs. Richardson's house, in the rear of which the mutilated body of the victim was found, or endeavouring to glean some additional particulars as to the circumstances of the tragedy. Up to half-past nine o'clock, the police at Commercial Street were unable to say that their investigations had been attended with success. Though our reporter elicited a statement regarding which important development might, it is thought, be expected. The Deptford police had made a communication to the effect that a man had been arrested by them under suspicious circumstances. On the receipt of the information at Commercial Street, Inspector Chandler started at once for Deptford, and at the time of telegraphing he had not returned with his charge, but was momentarily expected. The elapse of a few hours will suffice to know whether the man in custody in Deptford is in any way connected with the crime. The police authorities at Scotland Yard and Whitechapel are fully conscious of the difficult nature of the task that they have before him in identifying a particular individual with a series of appalling crimes. God knows, said an official to our reporter, but we may have another tonight. Though we have men patrolling the whole region of Whitechapel and Spitalfields, that the police are putting forth every possible effort, there can be no doubt. Tonight there is a large force on duty. One third of the men are in plain clothes, and even those entitled to have a leave of absence are retained. That the public are anxious to secure their efforts is testified by the presence on the record at Commercial Street 
of no less than 50 personal statements made with the object of assisting in the work of identification. One officer has been occupied for many consecutive hours in writing these statements out, and up to nine o'clock at night they were being supplemented by others. The police are not permitted to make public the evidence written, if evidence it can be called. It is doubtful if it will ultimately prove of much value, but our special representative in pursuing his investigations last night heard in the presence of the police a statement which perhaps ought not to be altogether dismissed as unworthy of notice. The informant was a young woman named Lyons, of the class commonly known as unfortunates. She stated that at three o'clock on Sunday afternoon she met a strange man in Flowers and Dean Street, one of the worst streets in the east end of London. He asked her to go to the Queen's Head public house at half past six and drink with him. Having obtained from the young woman a promise that she would do so, he disappeared, but was at the house at the appointed time. While they were conversing, Lyons noticed a large knife in the man's right-hand trouser pocket and called another woman's attention to the fact. A moment later, Lyons was startled with remarks which the stranger addressed to her. You are about the same style of woman as the one that was murdered. What do you know about her? asked the woman, to which the man replied, You are beginning to smell a rat. Foxes hunt geese, but they don't always find them. Having uttered these words, the man hurriedly left. Lyons followed until near Spitalfields Church, and turning around at this spot and noticing that the woman was behind him, the stranger ran at a swift pace into Church Street and was at once lost to view. One noteworthy fact in this story is that the description of the man's apparel is in all material points identical with the published description of the unknown and up to the present undiscovered leather apron. Over 200 common lodging houses have been visited by the police with the hope of finding the mysterious and much-talked-of person, but he has succeeded in evading arrest. The police have reason for supposing that he is employed in one of the London's sweating dens as a slipper maker, and that, as usual, to supply food and lodging in many of these houses, he is virtually in hiding. The police have reason for supposing that he is employed in one of the London sweating dens as a slipper maker, and that, as it is usual to supply food and lodging in many of these houses, he is virtually in hiding. Though Leather Apron was a figure well known to many policemen in the Whitechapel district prior to the murder of Mrs Nichols in Bucks Row, the man has kept himself out of the way since, and this is regarded as a significant circumstance. A statement made to an inspector that the man was heard making use of violent threats towards some women in a public house in Hanbury Street on Friday night is not considered to be of much importance as neither of the parties can be identified. The police feel strongly that some effort should have been made to detain the man who was alleged to have drunk beer early on Saturday morning in a public bar with bloodstains upon him. The generally accepted theory is that the whole series of murders are the work of one man, but a medical opinion is that the knife wounds on the woman found in August in George Yard may, after all, have been self-inflicted. Whether this was so or not, wounds were not of the kind inflicted on the later victim. Telegraphing later, the Press Association says that the man arrested in Deptford 
has not up to the present been brought to Commercial Road Police Station for the purpose of identification, and no further particulars concerning him can be obtained. Inspector Chandler has been to Deptford to see the prisoner, but what the result of his inquiries is, is kept secret. But it is understood that not so much importance is attached to the arrest as was the case in the first place. Reference is made to a mysterious being bearing the name of Leather Apron, concerning whom a number of stories have for a week or more been current in Whitechapel. The following is a description of the man. He is about five foot four or five in height and wears a dark, close-fitting cap. He is thick-set and has an unusually thick neck. His hair is black and closely clipped. His age is about 38 or 40, and he has a small black moustache. The distinguishing feature of his costume is a leather apron, which he always wears, and from which he gets his nickname. His expression is sinister and seems to be full of terror for the woman who describe it. His eyes are small and glittering. His lips are usually parted in a grin, which is not only not reassuring, but excessively repellent. He is a slipper maker by trade, but does not work. His business is blackmailing women late at night. A number of men in Whitechapel follow this degrading profession. He has never cut anybody as far as is known, but always carries a leather knife, presumably as sharp as other knives are wont to be. The knife a number of the women have seen. His name nobody knows, but are all united in the belief that he is a Jew or of Jewish parentage, his face being of a marked Hebrew type. But the most significant characteristic of the man is the universal statement that is moving about. He never makes any noise. What he wears on his feet the women do not know, but they agree that he moves noiselessly. His uncanny peculiarity to them is that they never see him or know of his presence till he is close by them. Leather Apron never by any chance attacks a man. He runs away on the slightest appearance of a rescue. One woman, whom he assailed some time ago, boldly prosecuted him for it, and he was sent up for seven days. He has no settled place of residence, but has slept often in a four-penny lodging house of the lowest kind in a disreputable lane leading from Brick Lane. The people at his lodging house, the people at his lodging house, denied that he has been there, and appeared disposed to shield him. Leather Apron's pal, Mickle Joe, was in the house at the time, and his presence had doubtless something to do with the unwillingness to give information. Leather Apron was last at this house some weeks ago although this account may be untrue. He ranges all over London and rarely assails the same woman twice. He has lately been seen in Leather Lane, which is in the Holborn district. This concludes this episode of Whitechapel Wednesdays, episode 6. We really hope you enjoyed the show. The next set of relevant chronological news reports will be uploaded next Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We are aiming for 1,000 subscribers. If you have already subscribed, our sincere thanks. It is very much greatly appreciated. We upload content daily. Our longer episodes are uploaded on Tuesdays, which focuses on a popular news story of its day. Wednesdays is for our Whitechapel Wednesdays, Thursdays a collection of stories around a theme, and our Serial Killer Saturdays. 
with shorter but we believe still interesting stories uploaded on the other days of the week. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.